Welcome to the Heart and Lung Research Podcast, a window into the world of research at Royal Brompton and Harefield Hospitals. I'm Julia Coffey and today I'll be talking to Dr Tina Khan about coronary heart disease. Coronary heart disease is responsible for more than 73,000 deaths each year in the UK. According to the NHS, we have 2.3 million people living with this disease, of which 2 million suffer from the type of chest pain known as angina. We'll be finding out how research Dr Khan has been working on may make a difference to patients whose angina is hard to treat. Dr Khan, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Can you briefly introduce yourself to listeners and explain how you became interested in coronary heart disease? Well, firstly, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm a cardiology specialist registrar. I've just completed my PhD and I Moving forward with my career, I want to have a joint academic as well as a clinical job, so I see myself as conducting further research. As a cardiology registrar, um, even throughout my clinical training and clinic, I really felt for patients who continue to suffer with angina in spite of the treatments that we can offer, such as bypass surgery and stents. Um, and I really empathise with the burden that these patients experience. And so it was that which attracted me to this particular area of research, because I believe there's a real dearth of effective treatments for these patients. And I think a lot of, lot needs to be done to find new avenues of treatment options. Please tell us more about coronary heart disease and angina. I understand the word angina used to be used in medicine as early as the 16th century and originates from the Greek word to strangle. Yes, Um, so essentially oxygenated blood is what is required to keep the heart muscle healthy and that is delivered to the heart muscle via coronary arteries and in normal healthy individuals the coronary arteries are patent and open and the blood uh, flows freely. However, in individuals where there are Arteries have become narrowed, either due to plaque or cholesterol deposition or clot. There is a compromise in the adequate oxygenated blood flow to the heart muscle, and that's what triggers angina or chest pain or the discomfort, the strangulation uh, sensation that you described. And why is angina hard to treat in some people? Yes, that's a good question. Obviously, we have things like bypass surgery, where effectively we get vessels from elsewhere in the body to bypass the problematic artery. And that works in a lot of people. And we also have the option of opening up narrowings with stents or basically tubes that can increase the blood flow. But unfortunately, there are some vessels that are simply not amenable to these forms of revascularization. So that's one reason. Another reason is that there are very also micro vessels or tiny vessels which actually impact upon chest pain, but which you simply can't reach with stents or fix with bypass surgery. Another contributing factor is that with these treatments like bypass and stents, they're improving all the time. So we now have this very large population of patients who've survived heart attacks and numerous events who are surviving for longer but surviving with residual chest pain. So these are some of the contributing reasons for this problem. And for many people living with angina, the symptoms can be controlled with conventional therapies. Your research is looking at patients who have angina that's difficult to treat. Can you tell us a bit about your research? Sure. So as you mentioned, this refractory angina group, which is basically defined by, as we've said, patients who continue to have angina in spite of revascularization techniques. What I wanted to do was I looked at a particular cholesterol called lipoprotein little a, which is felt to be a strong risk factor for coronary disease in general. And it was our suspicion as a research group that this may be a contributing factor towards refractory angina. So we specifically looked at patients with refractory angina and with raised levels of this cholesterol, and we wanted to know whether a particular treatment called lipoprotein apheresis, which physically removes this bad cholesterol from the blood, whether it could Im- improve symptoms and outcomes for these patients. Another important point to make here is that 
this particular cholesterol, although it's similar in structure to LDL cholesterol, it is resistant to all of the conventional lipid lowering treatments that we have to hand. So it's quite a problem cholesterol. So ultimately we wanted to see whether by treating it we could improve outcomes for our patients. And can you just explain a bit more about what evolved in apheresis? Sure. So it is essentially a blood-based treatment, a little bit like dialysis, if I may run a comparison. Basically, we, put, we, we gain access to patients' veins, and we put two cannulae into two different veins. And effectively, we, we remove blood from one vein, and it runs through a machine that contains a column that binds to certain cholesterols in the blood, pathogenic cholesterols that are causing disease. And the the blood that exits the bottom of the column is devoid or or has much lower levels of those cholesterols. And that that blood is then returned to the patient via the other cannula. And it's a continuous circuit. And we run that for about two to three hours per session. And patients need to be treated either weekly or fortnightly for this to be effective. Research studies can have a fair number of challenges. Can you tell us what yours were and how you overcame them? Sure. As we were looking at quite a subselect population, i.e. the refractory angina population, but on top of that, those with raised levels of this cholesterol, recruitment is always going to be quite a challenge. So one way that we overcame this was that I went around basically publicising my research within the trust and spoke to interventional cardiologists, surgeons, etc., in order to uh, source patients. And I also looked at databases of previous research that had been undertaken in refractory angina patients. I then went ahead and proactively set up a research recruitment clinic, which I think was key in aiding my recruitment. And so with, with all of these efforts, we actually managed to achieve... Uh, our recruitment targets. So that that's one of the challenges. And that, another of the challenges is basically once you've recruited patients, of course, compliance is key to a successful research trial. So we try to support our patients in as much as we could to really instill, to gain their confidence. I think we achieved that. And I'm very proud to say that we had excellent compliance in our research, but that of course was a concern at the beginning of the research, whether that would be feasible. Um, And did you involve patients at all in in helping you with the design? We did indeed. We had excellent input from our local patient advisory group at the very beginning of the trial. In fact, even before I recruited the first patient, I spoke with the Royal Brompton PAG group and I told them about my research plans, and I also gave them copies of the patient information sheets and the documentation that I would um, provide for patients. And I was pleased to, to, to get very good feedback from them and that they thought this was a, would be a very useful and beneficial trial for patients. But I was also able to implement some specific suggestions that they had in order to make the research more successful. It sounds like this has been a very successful study to run. What did the study find? So it was a very interesting study and we really enjoyed conducting it. Ultimately, it was a randomised control trial, but with a crossover design. So patients were either initially randomised to the aphoresis treatment that I described or to placebo treatments, and they completed, completed those treatments for a period of three months, weekly treatments for three months, and we did numerous investigations at the baseline and at the end of those three-month periods. And then after a one-month washout phase, patients then crossed over to the opposite treatment arm. Our primary endpoint, or our main outcome, was to look at the myocardial blood flow, which simply means the blood circulating to the heart effectively. And we we looked at um, the ratio of flow at stress to rest, which is a good indicator of how good the blood flow is. And I'm pleased to uh, share the fact that we did in fact find that there was a net improvement in the treatment group as opposed to what was seen in the sham group. 
And in terms of secondary endpoints, we also looked at the amount of carotid wall disease in, in terms of its the volume of carotid wall disease. And we looked at that as with MRI, as well as looking at the perfusion with MRI. And in that, we did find a small improvement as well. Other secondary endpoints, which of course I believe are much more important for patients, are that we looked at the patient's angina symptoms, and really that's what affects patients the most. And I'm pleased to also state that there was quite significant improvements in all five parameters of the Seattle Angina Questionnaire, which is a validated questionnaire for angina. We also looked at quality of life with the SF36 questionnaire and found improvements in the physical component. And last but not least, we also looked at um, the exercise capacity of patients with the six-minute walk test. And again, there we found a significant improvement in the treatment arm compared to sham. Of course, we also looked at lots of lab biomarkers, but I've named the key things that are probably most relevant for patients directly. The study's findings sound very exciting and could lead to much-needed improvements in caring for people with hard to treat angina. What do you think the next steps will be? I think the next steps, I, I'm uh, the first to acknowledge that my trial, although I believe it was nicely designed, was not a huge study. It was, I would consider it to be a pilot study. So I think moving forward, we need to have a much bigger trial, possibly a multi-centre trial, incorporating what we classify as major adverse cardiovascular events. So looking at what happens in terms of rates of heart attacks, stenting procedures, the requirement for bypass surgery, deaths in patients with refractory angina and raised lipoprotein little a treated with aphresis as opposed to placebo and follow them up for many years to, to get a better idea of, of the long-term impact on a bigger scale. I think also moving forward, I mean, my research really dealt with patients at the very end spectrum of disease and i.e. refractory angina, I think in the future I would love to take a step back and look at primary and secondary prevention. So, for example, when someone first presents with their first heart attack, and if you identify lipoprotein little a to be raised, do you go ahead and treat them for that then, before they end up with further sequelae of advanced coronary disease, or do you ignore it? You know, is there room to do something at that point? And then, so that's secondary prevention, and then taking a step even further back from that, say, before people develop any sort of coronary disease, do we screen patients at a young age for lipoprotein little a levels? And if we find it to be high, do we take a preventative strategy of implementing treatment for, from a very early stage, even before the onset of illness? So I think these are key areas of research that need to be conducted, and I would love to be a part of that. Another thought I have is that we have emerging therapies for lipoprotein little a in the future, which may rival apheresis. For example, antisense oligonucleotide treatments or PCSK9 inhibitors, and these may be less onerous for patients to comply with than, than apheresis. Which, although it's a fantastic and effective treatment, it is, after all, fairly invasive. So I think in the future, Another key thing to achieve is to run some non-inferiority trials to see if these new emerging drug options can measure up to the impact of apheresis. Can you explain non-inferiority trials? By that, I mean, okay, so with my trial, we, we've got some indication that apheresis may be beneficial mm. for patients with refractory angina and raised life approaching little a. However, moving forward, these new emerging treatments drug options, we, we, we don't know as yet whether they will achieve the same effect as apheresis, so that's what I mean by non-inferior. We have to prove whether they are inferior to apheresis or not, and with head-to-head you... -head trials. For research to make a difference, it needs to be disseminated, a word that literally means sowing seeds and goes beyond publishing. What has been your experience so far in sharing your findings? Yes, well, I was um, very honoured to be invited to present my trial findings at the late breaking science session of the European Society of Cardiology Conference in Rome 2016. So that was just a fantastic platform 
on which to present my research to thousands of cardiologists internationally. So that was a great opportunity. And of course, I, I do wish to, and I already have been invited to several other conferences to convey the research. So I guess that's a great way to convey the research to other specialists. Another way which we are also doing is that we aim to publish our trial findings in high-impact journals, and we're in the process of producing numerous papers arising from this research. Of course, I think it's not just clinicians that need to have messages disseminated to them, so I would like to find some means in which to convey findings to patients once we're at a stage that we are able to do that. A very big thank you to Dr Khan for joining us today. If you'd like to find out more about research being carried out at Royal Brompton Harefield Hospitals, please visit our website at www.rbht.nhs.uk forward slash research. The research in this podcast was supported by the National Institute for Health Research and was a collaboration between Royal Brompton and Harefield NHS Foundation Trust and Imperial College London. Thank you for listening today to the Royal Bronson Harefield Hospitals Heart and Lung Research Podcast.